Now, he's saying this because he wants you to see it that way. Your old life is dead. This is so different than what we generally think as Christians. Most of the time, what Christians think is, now that I'm a Christian, I need to, I need to make it be dead. I need to... <laughs> a lot of times we're trying to do what he's already done. You know, I, I ran into a man one time, nice man. He's a good man. I know this man. He's a man that lives here in town. A Christian man. Doesn't, you know, he goes to another church and, and he's a nice man. And uh, I, I don't mean this as criticism, just as to make a point. And uh, I, I met him one time at, uh, you remember Promise Keepers. Uh, don't you remember? We went, you went, came to, us, to a Promise Keeper meeting with us. And so I, I, I used to go to those all the time when they had it. And I went this, the one particular night and this, man, this particular Christian man was there and I said to him, Hello, brother. How are you doing? Kind of cheerful like that. And he said, Oh... That's what he said. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm serious. He said that. Oh, he said, it's hard. It's hard. He said, it's hard to crucify this old flesh. And I don't know what he was talking about. I don't know what he was doing, you know. But see, notice what it says here. Your old life is dead. <laughs> How much better it would be if we just take him at his word and say, my old life. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't face some challenges in that respect. But instead of saying, I'm going to try to kill it, say, no, it's dead. <laughs> I, you know, just, it's, a, it's, it's a better way to deal with it. It's dead. I refuse to listen to it. That doesn't mean you uh, aren't confronted with uh, uh, temptations and challenges, but the way you're supposed to look at it is to say it's dead. I consider it dead. I reckon it to be dead. I count it to be dead. Well, how do you know? Well, he says so right here. Your old life is dead. Uh, Paul uh, used to go with us to the... Uh, now, he works there. But he used to go with me when I started going to prison. Remember that, Paul? We'd go and have our services on... Uh, did you go with me when it was on Thursday nights? And was yeah, it? for sure. Yeah, I think, so. I think so, yeah. I remember this one particular man uh, used to come. And I don't know if you were here... Uh, tell me if this rings a bell with you, Paul. But this one uh, young man, he came to all of our services and he was really excited about it. And he kind of... Uh, kind of American Indian uh, kind of appearance. And, uh, but he was really excited. He always came early and he'd sit on the front row and he participated in everything, sang all the songs and, you know, had his Bible on his lap. And, and then, you know, really bright and, you know, gung-ho and, you know, pushing ahead and, you know, uh, doing everything right. And one night he came in and he was really down. You could tell he was really sad. Really, obviously upset. So I took him aside and said, what's wrong? What's the matter? And, because it wasn't like him. He's usually very cheerful and chipper. And uh, I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, I found out I'm going home next week. And I said, and you're sad about that? You, yeah. He says, well, I'm worried. He says, I'm, I, I'm, I'm afraid, he said. I'm afraid that I'm going to go home and I'm going to get mixed up in all the same things and the drugs and things. I'm going to get mixed up in all the same things that I was mixed up in before and then be right back here again. I'm afraid, he said. He had his Bible under his arm. I said, is that your Bible? And I said, yeah. He said, open it. Okay. Uh, open it, and I had him, not this passage, but another one. Actually, I had him turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. I, sa I said to him, Are you in Christ? Yeah. Well, it says here, You are a new creation. The next thing says, Old things have passed away. Elliot, would you put that up for me for a moment? 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'll just make a point from this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Let's see. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Give me the Amplified just for a second. I like what the Amplified says. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. The old, now listen to this, the previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Now it doesn't say it will pass away. It says it has passed away. So this young man who said he was upset and he was afraid and I said, read me that. And he read 2 Corinthians 5.17 from the King James Version. And we had talked about this before. I said, you know, when it says the old, it means you're, the previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. I said, what you're afraid of, you said, you're, you're afraid that it's going to come back. But I want to remind you of what Paul says here. Your previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. What you need to do instead of being afraid is... Agree with what the Bible says. It has passed away. See, we've got a choice what we believe from moment to moment, from day to day. Instead of being afraid, I'm afraid it's going to come back. You need to stand up and be a man and say, no, it's passed away and it'll never come back. I'm never going back. I choose to look at it this way, you see. Let's go back now to Colossians chapter 3. 
made that point to you. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, and uh, where were we? Verse uh, 3. Let's see now. We were in the message. I think we were reading this from the message translation. Sorry about that, Elliot. You've got to push a lot of buttons today. Your old life is dead. Now that's pretty plain, isn't it? That's the way you're supposed to count it and consider it. My old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, nobody else can see it, uh, but it's true, nevertheless, is with Christ in God. He is your life. One more verse. When Christ, your, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too. The real you. The glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. Now he says, when Jesus shows up on earth, the real you, listen to what he says, the real you, the glorious you, will show up too. Now it doesn't show up right now, but that's the real you nevertheless. The real you, partaker of His glory, it's not yours, you've got nothing to boast about, it's His. But He makes you a co-heir, a co-participant with, let me read you those definitions again. Uh, something that gives praise and honor to God, a manifestation of God, who He is, what He does, the manifest perfection of His character revealed, brightness and splendor emanating from the presence of God. Wow, that's pretty spectacular, isn't it? What does this do if we see it that way? Well, the reason Paul presents this to the Colossians and to us is so that if we see it this way, his, his hope is, his goal is that we, it changes the way we look at ourselves and the way we conduct ourselves. Now, there's one more I want to read you about this. It's in uh, 2 Corinthians. We were just there a second ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 this time. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I think I want to begin reading with verse 5. Second, we're talking about the glory of God as it pertains to the saints or to you and me. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Paul says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. That's a good way to look at it. We're not sufficient. That's true. Uh, and we don't think of ourselves as sufficient, but our sufficiency is of God. So we are, but it's of God. Uh, it's not of ourselves. It's, it's, it's all Him. He gets all the praise and the glory out of it. Verse 6. Who also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now he's contrasting the New Testament, which he calls the Spirit, with the Old Testament, which he calls the letter. Verse 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. He's referring back to the Old Testament when Moses went up on the mountain with God and got the law and he came back down. All the people couldn't stand to look at him because of his contact with God. It caused his face to glow, if you remember that story. Moses' face was glowing with the glory of God. It wasn't the glory of Moses, it was the glory of God. But it was reflected on the face of Moses because he'd been in contact with God. Is that right? So they had to put a veil over his face. And uh, they had to veil his face to cover that, the, the glory that was uh, so blinding to people. Which glory was to be done away. That is to say, after a while, the glory went away and, uh, and it was gone. Verse 8, he says, by contrast... How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? In other words, if there was the glory of God involved in giving the Old Testament, how much more glory is there in giving the Spirit? Verse 9, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more, uh, not much less, but much more, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. In other words, if that Old Testament law that produced condemnation was glorious, how much more glory is there involved in this administration of righteousness which Christ gives to us? Verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. In other words, even that glory uh, involved with Moses in the Old Testament is made to seem as though it didn't exist by reason of the excelling glory of the New Testament.